Okay, I'm gonna have right, to go let me get on my side. <laughs> All right, this is here. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Walker. Um, we know many of you, for those of you who don't, we are Amanda Hunt, Head of Public Engagement, Learning, and Impact. I am Henrietta Holdish, Chief Curator and Director of Curatorial Affairs. Yes, to both of us. Um, thank you. Um, I would like to ground us by acknowledging um, that the Walker Art Center and the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden are located on the contemporary, traditional, ancestral homelands of the Dakota people. The site that we're all gathering on tonight was once an expanse of marshland and meadow and ho holds meaning for Ojibwe, Dakota, and people from other indigenous nations who live in the community today. Um, this event was very long in the making. Um, we're celebrating the opening of Khalil Robert Irving's exhibition, Archaeology of the Present. It actually opened to the public at the end of February. Uh, we were going to have this very event with the same group of speakers at, on that day, um, and we were um, shut down by a snowstorm. We were really happy that everybody, in spite of some other crazy weather, smog and heat, made it tonight. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to you to talk a little bit about the event. Thanks, Henrietta. By hook or by crook, we are here tonight. I'm so thrilled uh, to be welcoming Gerald Cooper, Antoine Sargent, and Khalil Robert Irving back, or for the first time in some instances, to our stage. Uh, we are just um, ready to be in dialogue about the exhibition on view. It's been with us. Uh, since this winter and it's Men an incredible and women who installation uh, on view upstairs. Uh oh, <laughs> Johnson Publishing Company has something to say. Um, regrounding. Uh, so we are just really happy to be in the space of ideas, of architecture, of black history, of black design and culture. Um, I'm just really happy to see these three folks come together and be in a dialogue about all of their research, their life work, their curatorial practice, their artistic practice. Um, Gerald, Khalil, and Antoine have had roving conversations um, very much outside of the institutional space, uh, and so I think it'll be a privilege to just hear what they've been thinking about together, separately, um, in the context of this exhibition and beyond. Uh, so before we Go into brief speaker bios, just thanks to our funders. We're extremely grateful to the Edward Bazinet Foundation and RBC Wealth Management for making the exhibition possible. Um, St. Louis-based artist Khalil Robert Irving creates complex and layered assemblages of images and sculptures comprised of replicas of everyday objects, really skillfully and gorgeously. Mainly working in ceramics, uh, Khalil engages critically with the history of the medium and challenges uh, constructs around identity and culture in the US, specifically questioning the historical conditions of under-recognized racism and anti-blackness. Antoine Sargent is a writer, curator, and director at Gagosian. His recent books include The New Black Vanguard, Photography Between Art and Fashion from 2019, a beautiful book if you haven't seen it. Uh, and Young, Gifted, and Black, a new generation of artists uh, more recently in 2020. His recent exhibitions include the group series Social Works and solo presentations of artists Rick Lowe, Tyler Mitchell, Awal Rizku, Amanda Williams, Virgil Abloh, and Alexandria Smith. And Gerald Cooper is a creative consultant and the creator of Hood Mid-Century Modern, which is, in short, a modern black history preservation society calling attention to the fact that black folks have been here all along creating mid-century modern design, contributing to these histories, and I'm thrilled to welcome all three to the stage. Yo, yo. Minneapolis, <laughs> St. Paul. <laughs> Thank you all for being here this evening. It's a pleasure to join the stage with these two, and it's also a wonderful opportunity to be back here in Minneapolis at the Walker Art Center. Um, I just wanted to start with this video. Oh, I did what they said. So I have to press what twice. Did you have much money when you started publishing? No, I had no money at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the $500, which I started the company with, uh, was borrowed uh, on my mother's furniture.
Thank you very much. It is not a day of personal triumph for one man. It is rather a day of promise for all men and all women. Men and women who believe that the cutting edge of hope is sharper than the bars of indifference and bias. For that reason and for others as well, I would like to share this day with friends, relatives and associates who helped to make it possible. The message is also conveyed by what is perhaps the largest collection of black art in the world. The black art, the horizontals, the glass, the marble, the fabrics, the warm colors, all these elements integrated into one grand design express the essential meaning of our firm. It expresses openness, openness to truth, openness to light, openness to all of the events swirling in all of the black communities of our country. At the same time, tasteful and spectacular, the $8 million, 11-story Johnson Building officially opened May 16, 1972. It is fitting that this first office building built by a black man in Chicago's prestigious loop has become a city showplace, together with its $250,000 Afro-American art collection and its 6,000-volume black-oriented library. It is intended as a bold and positive statement about the company's commitment to the black people it serves. From the soaring 18-foot-high lobby walls, covered with bronze, to the beautiful fabrics and colors throughout, the building was, according to the architect, designed as a place where black creativity could blossom and where the production of black magazines could be a joy. The move from your previous offices at 1820 South Michigan to 820 South Michigan is really only 10 city blocks in Chicago. Is there any other significance to it? Yes, there is, because I first uh, purchased the building back in 1949, and it was on a borderline um, neighborhood as far as race is concerned. And when I first tried to buy the building, uh, as a black person, I was refused. And so I had several choices before me. I could uh, protest to the NAACP, or I could march around the building, or I could get a white friend to buy the building for me. And this is what I did. Uh, I did not have a chance to see the building, and so my white friend um, said to the owner that he had a, an engineer, which really meant a janitor, uh, who would like to see the building. And so I dressed in janitor's clothes, and this is the way I first saw the building, which I later purchased at 1820 South Michigan Avenue, because this was in 49, and I remained there until uh, I came here uh, in December of 1971. You know, as that was playing, there are so many things that uh, kind of swirled through my head, but it made me just want to start this conversation by asking Gerald a question. When did you happen upon this uh, video? And I know you're from Chicago, and did you happen to see this video on public television growing up? Do you want to go first, Gerald? Yeah, first of all, wow, happy to be here. It's crazy, finally. Congratulations, you know what I mean? <laughs> just amazing work, just, just unbelievable. Um, Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I, I found this video um, not too long ago, maybe like three months ago. Um, for the last three years, I've been digging intensely for stuff like this, you know? Um, and shout out to um, Tom Brown, who has tons, amazing archive of um, very newsworthy stories like this uh, around the black community and it's been where does he live um i think i feel like tom is from um chicago or like lives in chicago from chicago but his archive has been supported by archive.org um and i think i found this like in a university but this clip because it's a longer you know it's a longer clip this clip just embodied um a lot of the reality as well as like this this like this futurism, this sort of thought of what should it look like. And uh, I thought it would be one of the more powerful, and I'm so, so glad that you pinpointed it as something that, that you felt. And so, yeah, I found it like not too long ago. Yeah, no, I, I was, as I was sort of watching this, um, 
first of all, congratulations on the show. It's, it's spectacular. But thank you. Um, it's also really great because we're all from the Midwest. You know, right. I'm from Chicago, St. Louis, uh, Cincinnati. Um, and, you know, he was like a he, I remember going to this building when I was a kid because, wow. it, you know, he was a sort of a, a larger than life figure, a hero. Um, but I've never seen this particular clip. But what was so sort of striking about this is that, you know, when was this, 1979? Yeah. That the stakes haven't really changed, you know, for um, those of us who are pushing to sort of um, recognize, you know, new possibilities around what space can do, right? And I was sort of really taken by, because you always sort of, when you were thinking about the Johnson, Ar what became the Johnson Archive, mm -hmm. um, and the work that Safety Astor and others have done around activating, um, you know, Lorna Simpson's in her own way, McElene Tom, you know, David, all, Hart. David Hart, Hank Willis Tom, I mean, the list sort of goes on and on. Um, you never hear about the actual art that they own, that, that right. the you know that right. they owned, right? You hear about the images, you hear about the magazine, you, like the things that were sort of publicly available, right? And I was sort of struck by the fact that um, <laughs> it was you know when he said the horizontals, you know, like it was like you know like that he was sort of trying to create a language, right, and create an environment which is not unlike what you do. And so for you, why did you select this particular? video or this particular clip what did it how did it speak to you and your practice well i have to say i spend some time on the internet and i spend some time on instagram and i spend time in books and i i'm looking at a lot of stuff and i take a lot of pictures of different things i really am i don't want to say this but i have to be honest i, I take pictures sometimes while driving of billboards and it's like i want to see the billboard but i also want to see the composition and lately I've been fascinated with taking pictures of uh, rear view mirrors with whatever's in the rear view mirror. And so in a minute of ex you know, dealing with the phone or doing whatever, Gerald just posted it. And so sitting and thinking about, the, I mean, my father was born in 72. My grandmother was uh, 25, 26 years old at this time, living in St. Louis, working at the city hospital you know, and the kind of the legacy and the history of St. Louis and how it came to be. And, and at this time was also the major decline of St. Louis. So major swaths of the city were starting to be picked apart and destroyed, uh, but not too far away, five hours away, this is existing. But Chicago's also the city that also put the black first black mayor out into the world, also put Barack Obama into the world. Uh, and so in a, in a way, thinking about the legacies and kind of the kind of stratification through time and, and history and who existed in those specific times is something that I'm interested in, even though you may not necessarily see it in the work, uh, apparently, but that space, spaces or uh, experiences at specific times can become catalysts. Mm -hmm. And then this, like, so to make reference to the introduction, people like, I don't show a lot of things that aren't ceramic just because I may have my own trepidation about showing different materials. Uh, but this exhibition is very much built in relationship to thinking about industry mm -hmm. and it's fr and fragments of industry in relationship to ceramics. Mm -hmm. But this is also a fragment or a, a facet of industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so just reflecting on that, he bought this new building, he outfitted, he said, they put bronze on the wall. <laughs> you know, like that's, you know, a, yeah. an intentional choice. Uh, and so this exhibition here at the Walker is all is is in not not in the the league of what he's doing, but thinking about the capacity of experience. I do wonder. You know, it's so funny because I'm thinking about the John. I was so thinking about buildings and thinking about sort of um, architectures and and you know. So I was born in Cabrini Green housing projects. And so that's a very particular, if anyone's from Chicago or, I mean, it's probably a famous fucking, you know, you probably know what it is. Um, and it was so, you know, like those buildings, you know, and which is not different than, you know, sort of other sort of housing yeah, projects. Piratago. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, St. Louis. And, and it was really, it's so, I also just thought about sort of like decay and decline, right? of those industries or sort of those architectures, right? And sort of the disappearance of, right? Mm -hmm. And so now, um, you know, like my family lives in a townhouse on former Cabrini land, mm -hmm. right? 
and I there's four of us. I don't know how this gets so personal, but I, stay with me. There are four of us. I have a younger brother. Um, he's about ten years younger than me, and was not born in Cabrini, right? But mostly spent his house in this townhouse. And if you know, Cabrini is sort of unique in that that it sits in the shadow of downtown Chicago, right? And so on the have, west side or south? No, side? no, it's on. It's like literally in downtown Chicago, oh, in downtown. basically um, near North is what they call it. Um, Underneath the Gold Coast, exactly. Like literally in the shadow of it, um, and but there was this class sort of differential, and there was this erasure that sort of happens. That you know, going to the Johnson Building, it was very much like you know, you live in Cabrini, like you need to be expire to, you know what I mean? It was like this, it was not sort of like a equal sort of like all blackness or all whatever. It was really like these kids need help or reform or whatever. And so I, I think about that in relationship whenever I sort of think about the Johnson, because there is this sort of vibrant, like black upper class, you know, like that sort of exist in Chicago, definitely in other, you know, sort of um, uh, cities, but, and that was sort of, there was definitely that class sort of element to um, the discussion with them, you know, with the jo with the Johnson family and, and all that, uh, but it's sort of stepping back in this moment or like being in this moment and this sort of is totally gone, right? Like the building sold, the archive has been, you know. Part of it was shown here in this building. Yeah, and the Astor did what he did and then now it's like in the Getty and in DC, you know, but like, you know, it's not accessible to public in any sort of real way. And so like, in its totality. Yeah. It, you know, and so it's like, a, it's so, so interesting to sort of be, I you know I was like thinking about you, what you do, right. In these sort of fa fragments and sort of like the recalling these histories that have been in some ways erased. Right. And I, I don't know, it was like a sort of tangent, but it's something that I was thinking about in relationship to sort of what you do. Right. Because, None of this, he built all this stuff and none of it exists anymore, right? right. Yeah, it's hard. Well, this is an exhibition for anybody who hasn't been able to enter the galleries just yet. Um, maybe I'll just start with like a, like a kind of breakdown of what is in the room just from this perspective. You got a flag that enters, that opens the gallery and then you have a video work that you look at from above. This thing is covered in brick tile um, and you can touch it. This sculpture was made in 2019 and completed this year for this exhibition. There are three sculptures that you look at from above, and then there's a, another sculpture that you can touch um, further. Yeah, what so flag this, is that? This. It's a made up one I made up myself. <laughs> I've, I've been making flags for a while. I don't show them that often, but. Um, I make up flags mostly as a, just a, a material that can be used that also comes with inherent information. And so a flag marks place. Um, but this flag's title is Sentinel number two. So I've made a different work using a black on black, a black, white, and blue flag. You might know what it is. And then a black, a white on white striped flag with a chain link fence embroidered on its surface. So you're looking through these three flags and you see the blue Lives Matter flag in the middle, mm -hmm. but it's really activated uh, complicatedly with light. Um, Are you thinking about, in any of those sort of processes, were you thinking at all about David Hammonds or like dealing with that? Well, maybe, yeah, that's where it started and when I was in college, but I've just been holding, like in other presentations, I have like this back of this truck where, you know, there's Trump flags and then the next slide is a back of a truck with a pride festival and you see like all these different kinds of flags on it. So it's just like how flags are being, how they operate in today's environment and, and experience. Yeah. Not necessarily that it's like, it can go anywhere <laughs> now, but right now it's just marking place. I use found flags, I make flags. <laughs> It's also, I just, I, um, it's just, what's in, what's cool is that it's a digital print on a material that can do multiple different kinds of black at the same time. There aren't so many opportunities where you can see multiple kinds of blacks. Mm -hmm. Not just a Carrie James Marshall painting, but you can. <laughs> <laughs> Which is in gallery six, if you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. So I, I asked these two here because of our relationship to the Midwest and the three different capacities at which we engage with the different things and how we dealt with them growing up and and also just I don't I don't need to I don't need a celebration all the time, but it's also nice to be able to hear other people's kind of engagement or ideas around the work in relationship to what they do as well. So it's been interesting to to to, because Khalil has a carpet in Cincinnati at a museum that I visit quite often, and so I get I get to engage with his work a lot. And one of the one of the images on the carpet is a box. Uh, black and Miles, yeah, Black yeah, and Miles. So like little cigars, um, and I don't know, right? Like I don't go, you know, my life, you know, my real life, like we're we're like Black and Miles are a real thing. My brother, like you know what I mean? But um, these objects that you that you um, place and that you uh, insert, where do they like? What's their derivative? Like for this one, what's the derivative of? A lot of the objects in this in the ceramics and and on these on these I don't even know call the slabs or whatever. Well, when we were listening to when Antoine was sharing about can, uh, Chicago and going from play, one place to another to experience something and thinking about the issue of class and its relationship, the ground is an ever exp- ever extending expanse that doesn't necessarily see class until it's delineated into specific spaces. Mm-hmm. So these uh, kind of metaphorical grounds or skies have objects that um, relate to a place and no place. Mm. Because I'm in a lot of ways trying to figure out how to make the digital realm, make space for the digital realm in the real. Mm. So there's a, this technique that you can use with ceramics called image transfers. And so the image transfers, you can do black ones, you can do blue ones, you can do red ones, but you could also do multicolored ones where you can print something out and slip it on some ceramic and put it in the kiln, and next thing you know, boom, boom, one to one. But it's a different kind of, if you think of it conceptually or materially in relationship to visual art, it's a kind of an extension and furthering of the kind of conversation around uh, photography and collage. I don't consider myself a photographer, but I do consider myself engaging with the lens and the lens as a capacity not only to see through, but to s- for also to be seen. And so the kind of layers within these, it's like multiple layers, just like how Mrs. Johnson was describing multiple layers of what his intent in relationship to his impact was. It's we heard a lot of in, intent, but like the pho- I mean, I never really thought about it as photo- or like in relationship to photography. But there is there is this thing that happens in the work that I'm always sort of struck by, which is perspective, and like like you know like even in the the um, ceramics that are the sort of the ones that you've been working with on for like the last fourteen years, those there's so many different perspectives mm-hmm. in that work. From, you know, in this particular one, like you have the vase and then you have, you know, like you have all of these different sort of positions you can take with that particular work, which is not unlike looking. Right. Right. And which is so it's so interesting for you to talk about in relationship to photography. But you are constantly taking pictures. Snapping. Yeah. And scanning things into the computer. So I try to dig, but I'm not the good. I'm not the best digger. Uh, in terms of fi- going to look through things to find things, I'm not really a looker. It's more, it's more diaristic. Collecting for me is more diaristic. It's in relationship. It's in connection and in congruency with my life. Right. Similar to your works, mm-hmm. you know what you do too is along with your life. It's not that it is like you wake up and this is what I'm doing every day. Boom, I get this job. Boom, this is my house. You know, I feel our. I feel like our lives are a little bit more fluid. Yeah, the archive is just so present in your work, and um, I feel like the black archive is one of the more most endangered things in this country right now. Um, just like the Johnson and Johnson publishing thing, right? It's like, why do why am I presenting that? Right, you know what I'm saying? And then that reality. But we also may not know the like high school black history teacher in a certain neighborhood did, yeah. at a certain point who also mm-hmm. showed the whole movie yeah, yeah, yeah. you know and all the kids in the classroom fell asleep mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> but what like what what do you 
where are you finding the things that you um, express through? Like, well, we can talk about. So this piece of paper in the sculpture is covered in a majority of a, a piece of newspaper actually from the 40s uh, from Chicago. And I was looking for something about the Klan, but I wasn't necessarily looking for an article, a headline article about them, about white people burning a K on a man's face. And so I was like, well, this is going to Minneapolis. <laughs> Let's put that in there. And then this New York Times ceramic piece of paper, part of it is like ads, part of it is smaller stories from another time, like 2015 or 16, and then the main story is about uh, the death people, the United States reaching half a million deaths of people um, not being able to live through having COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third sheet of paper is like a collage of ads. It's like all internet ads, the whole thing just about. So it's like about placing different times on the same plane, but also connecting that it's like you could pass by all this just like it is on the street and like not give a fuck about what the story is, you know. So it's like it's 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 a kind of like flattening, but it's but if you what if we flattened a spiral? Like what if the edges of the spiral came closer? Because you know they say oh well, life's like you know is not linear. It's a spiral. So if you, what if we spiralized everything and then kind of like pulled it back like a shrinky would, or a slinky, would we be closer? Would some information be able to be closer if it was like a slinky? Uh, but then another, the, the last artifact on the top of the sculpture is also this set of gold. Oh, I probably should not tell you all this, but there's like a set of black or, or uh, gold teeth sitting in the bottom of the sculpture. Scared somebody gonna take them. I'm always afraid of people touching my work. So that's why I gave people two things to touch. <laughs> this is one you can touch. Uh, let's see. This it's is also, one you can touch. It's also interesting from the work, you know, those particular floor ceramics have evolved in this particular show um, to sort of, it's not in that one, but the where you sort of have put sort of a lip on it, mm -hmm. right? And I was wondering if you could talk about that sort of evolution in the work. Well, I have to say, Antoine organized an exhibition here. Let me skip ahead quite a bit, skip through my slides. This is an exhibition that Antoine organized at Gagosian Gallery in London uh, in 2021. Oh, Amanda Williams, who's also... Uh, yeah, and so the artist, Amanda Williams, Rick Lowe, and Amanda Williams' paintings, what is it, how to find the best black for you? Or which black do you? What black, what black is this say? What black is the same? What black does this say? Oh, what black does yeah. this say? What black does this one say? And then these are two floor sculptures here. So Antoine and I have worked together on a project and this is a, a bigger one, but it's like two in one. That's uh, Isaac Julian. And this is a beautiful photograph by the artist Isaac Julian, Sir Isaac Julian, Sir CBE, uh, who has a beautiful <laughs> exhibition at the Tate Bridge. I know, I was just there. It's like unbelievable. Yeah. Designed by Sir David Adjay. So the sirs came together. <laughs> um, but yeah, they have evolved. And I involved it to have a lip uh, for the exhibition here at the Walker. We just, you know, it's just, I should have just gave slides and we just like, just let it flip. Because that's some good content in there. Um, but the frame or the lip on this, the title of the work starts with the pool. Mm -hmm. So uh, these sculptures are made in relationship to my some research and experience of going to museums like many of you all like to go to museums. In 2018, I was at the Brooklyn, uh, the Baltimore Museum of Art, and they had a huge hall of Antioch mosaics. Mm -hmm. And so if anyone in here knows where Antioch is, you could tell everybody it's in Turkey. Uh, Antioch was an ancient Roman town that had some of the most marvelous uh, mosaics on floors, walls, and ceilings. And so if, when I started to think about that history, I'd already thought about sculpture in a complicated way. Well, I was like, well, let's keep making it a little bit more complicated and make it in reference to ancient Roman capacity of building buildings and then decorating said buildings. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I wanted, I also read an art, uh, essay by an, a historian named Elaine Locke, and there's an essay called Ancestral Arts, and he tells the black artist to find where you come from and what was made before you, but don't copy it. Mm -hmm. Think of it as in reference and make your own. Yeah. And so to combine Antioch Mosaics and Elaine Locke through me, mm -hmm. born this. What's sort of interesting is that you took sort of a um, aesthetic sort of, you know, element to sort of apply to the street, right? Which is usually sort of not thought of in that way, right? And so you've taken the, but a ceiling has, right? Like historically, right? And um, I find that just fascinating that you've sort of applied what we've sort of associated with the heavens to the street, right? Which is a, which is sort of interesting because of the way that that it implies the street, but also the universe, like these these particular works. Okay, I'm gonna skip ahead. Um, I'm just gonna run through these really quick. This is a large brick granary uh, walls for a uh, brewery in St. Louis that is falling apart. It's called the Lamp Brewery. It's down the street from my studio, and it's quite insane. These are like like 12 stories, 14 stories tall, sitting in secession. Um, Remind, you know, that reminds me of Zeitz Mocha in yeah, Cape exactly, Town. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I was there, did a hard hat tour there with um, the architect and the former director, and, you know, he just cut right through them. Yep. And they're Gorgeous. still, yeah, I mean, it's like unbelievable. Then, then then, that reference makes me think about the, the explosion in Lebanon. Right, right. We know what this is. Don't even need to explain it. New York Times said it for us. Um, that is very interesting to me. That cracks me up. Oh, that's so funny. If you can see the humor or reality in that, that's uh, fucked up. Dr. Omar. Yeah. Dr. Omar delivering. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, in all seriousness, this is a reference to uh, someone who's very important to me that I've learned about uh, who we've all maybe seen. There's a monument that was made in 1864, I think, by an artist named Thomas Ball. He was commissioned by freed black people to make something we know as the Emancipation Monument. Mm -hmm. Archer Alexander is the black man who's kneeling in the front part of the sculpture mm -hmm. underneath um, Abraham Lincoln's hand. And this is a book where I found the names of the um, brick factories Archer was enforced or forced to work in when he was enslaved, living in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a photograph that we have of Mr. Alexander and living in St. Louis and, and in the Midwest, we have these cities that are built out of red brick that have been picked apart and uh, moved to other places, Los Angeles, New Orleans, to build uh, new buildings. But this man's labor and many other people's labor was used to kind of, you know, in some capacity, build even my own house. That's and why so, in that show, in that room at, in Social Works, that brick, Amanda's mm -hmm. brick in your, yeah. And that brick is one of the ones from St. Louis. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that she dipped in gold leaf. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next slide. And so I, and one part of the work that is not used here, but one reference in that I'm thinking about in relationship to brick construction is the soldier's row. And so if, we, if, if uh, all the bricks lined up that Archer had to press, that you know, or if I made another line drawing, it would be the soldiers' row for him, you know, or for many black people who ha are unknown who uh, were forced to work. I mean, even my grand my grandma was a nurse for fifty years, and she worked tirelessly taking care of other people's kids and her own, you know. So you know, that's a, a using a, a gesture that's in architecture, but as a gesture for memory or memorial for others. And uh, now we get to social works. Yeah. It's so funny because I'm working on this project in St. Louis um, with David Ajay or Sir David Ajay, uh, if you like. Um, and it's all, I wish I, I should have brought pictures of it, but it's all, it's going to be at the Griot Museum, which is a black museum in St. Louis that um, uses St. Louis Brook. And what he did was um, crushed 
all of the St. Louis brick and mixed it with St. Louis dirt um, to make these earthworks, these, mm. oh, these earth sco sculptures. And they sort of bend, um, they sort of bend and they are sort of living in a sense that they're earth. And so it's like it oxidizes the air and, um, and that opens, if anyone's from St. Louis, that opens on, on July 15th. David would open um, that at the Griot um, and it's, per it's a permanent, Right. So I, I learned a lot about St. Louis Brick <laughs> over the last uh, 14 months. <laughs> I mean, St. Louis, Chicago, Cincinnati, Minneapolis, you know, communities of people traveled far and wide to come to the United States. And these are the cities in which either people's ancestors traveled to to live here and work or they traveled from Europe or wherever to come here to live. And that brick was made by their hands to build the buildings in which they were living. And it was built community by community. It was built by neighborhood by neighborhood. All, a lot of these Midwestern cities were. And it's, it was so funny because they were saying that like, there's also like a certain value to the brick because like they don't make it anymore in that the same way. And so they were saying that I, they were just saying that people were used to, like were once a, like at a certain time was like stilling that brick. They're because still doing they it. Sti See, yeah. They do that everywhere, though. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. They were the thing that, about like, the there's a value to it because of the way it was made. Yeah. And so they are just like basically these old houses are just like taking chunks of brick out of the. Oh, they the take houses. the whole building down. They don't take chunks. They take, they let the building burn. <laughs> right. Then they pick the brick from the top down. Wow. Because if you pick bottom chunks out of a building, the top of the building's gonna fall on yeah. you. But I mean, twentieth century, ninth, wait, eighteenth and nineteenth century mm -hmm. labor for twentieth century construction. Right. And profit, twenty first century profit. profit. Which is sort of, which is because you think about bricklayers and. There's a certain sort of devaluing of that labor, right? And so it's like this mm -hmm. sort of full circle moment, right? This thing that was the yeah, ceramics, right? <laughs> yeah, like you know what I mean, similar material, but like one seems, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of things that are done by hand seem to be devalued, mm -hmm. right? Even if you work front of house, you know, right? It's interesting the value prop because I didn't know that about St. Louis brick. Cincinnati brick too. Yeah, but I don't like. And Chicago. Well, I mean, no stuff? one, no one, no one's worried about. You know no I mean? one's well, worried like, about the people, the things yeah. that build the house. Yeah, because like a lot of, a lot of the um, thing that makes the thing. Yeah, a lot of like this. My block, y'all in Cincinnati, and I remember this. Um, oh, there are pits. No, I'm gonna let you do it. Um, okay, sure. Um, <laughs> sure. It's just like we didn't know. We there's such a veneer over my sit over the city that I live in where I don't know nothing. I mean, like, you know, we had, you know, the, the street name, like, you know, all of this stuff. And I remember seeing this house and it was a couple other, I call that case study number one. But I remember being drawn to like, yo, that's, it feels different. You know what I'm saying? Like walking up the street, we had a bunch of like apartment buildings. We had like a, you know, just a lot of things going on. But like to find out about the neighborhood, what it was before we got there, it's just this, it's, it's just seemed, you know, it I seems mean, you so to grow into that kind of maturity. Yeah, I wish. But, it, I, I, but wish I also think it's about the thing that I was, the point I was trying to make, which I was, was fairly and eloquent about it, was that we, li I mean, Cabrini Green are built out of these fucking bricks, you know. Right. Like I lived in a red building that looked just like this, mm. but it was, it was about that, like that had no value, right? Yeah, yeah. Like I was sort of trying to get to. That's what I was trying to say was that. The building that Mr. Johnson built was val you know, had value. Had implied yeah, and value. Exactly. invested. Yeah. And so I was that's what I was sort of trying to say. Like this sort of there was this class sort of thing um, that was sort of operating and it was saying that your building, you know, the high rise I lived in, eighteen story high rise that I lived in had no value, but we had to go down to see this building that you know what I mean? It was yeah. and so I think it relates to like, yeah, walking through a neighborhood and you know, because design is not for you know, they're you know, you're when you're when you live in sort of a neighborhood that is devalued for whatever reason, mm -hmm. they you know, it's as if it hasn't been designed, right? Right, right, right. like like undesigned. Yeah. yeah. And then the value, and then who holds the value, right? And that's where I think this shit lives right now. It's like if we skip, as we take the brick, we take the brick from the hood, bring it to the museum, the museum buys it. 
and then you yeah, know what I mean? Like, how do we ha- like who value? You know what I mean? Where can I make it even more complicated? Yeah, you have a shell company that buys a whole bunch of property. The mm-hmm. whole city knows who is the person who owns said shell mm-hmm. company. Let's all the buildings be to come destroyed and dilapidated. They all burn down. They all fall down. The yeah, material is collected. Then the land is open and mm-hmm. vacant. And so a white man owns predominantly all the land on the north side mm-hmm. of St. Louis so that then when they go to reinvest and redevelop, then he's the one who makes the money yeah. off of the land yeah. that he purchased to d- and destroyed the homes yeah. that were also built by his ancestors when they traveled from Germany wherever to come to St. Louis. Mm-hmm. You see, now that's the edit, the added flip, mm-hmm. where it's we live in an incestuous environment. And the hand me down is like, you know, what I mean, like, yo, where you get that? You be like, yo, Goodwill, and it st- it stops there. So it reminds me of like, it reminds me of the African American cultural like heritage experience where every generation it stops again, and it stop and it starts and it stops. And like, there's a brother that's doing a festival here in in Minneapolis. And he's doing it on a on a place where there was a black festival or cultural festival, fifty years before him, and he would have never known it unless he kind of dug in and, and found it. And so, well, that's actually how we also first <clears throat> met because right before the pandemic, mm-hmm. I was uh, invited to make the carpet at the Contemporary Art Center Cincinnati, and the project was twofold. I would design a large forty foot wide wallpaper that would um, decorate part of the building and I also was asked to redesign the lobby carpet. The building was built by Zaha Hadid. It was her first building in the United States. She constructed a fragment of the building called an urban carpet. It's this huge concrete slab that was cast that goes all the way up one part of the building almost like a spine. And so my kind of reverberation back to Zaha who's also who's also passed um, so I can't actually ever ever talk with her about the carpet. I designed a street carpet that's woven similar or tough carpet similar to this, but the technology uses images in the tough. So I can send them an image and the tough will print it and it'll look like black and miles. It'll look like asphalt sitting on the ground. You'd be surprised. It looks like litter. Just type in Khalil Irving Contemporary Art Center Cincinnati. You'll find it. <laughs> um, but Gerald, when that wallpaper went up and then the pandemic started, the carpet never came. But Gerald wrote me, asked me if we could project uh, my work on the side of a building, a two-story building in Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's so, it's so, it's so interesting to think about where where things come, where essentially value um, orients itself or originates. Because I feel like we, I feel like black folks give a lot of value to things and. Again, I have this like this. I feel this cautionary tale of things that happen in Cabrini Green, things that happen in Marcy Projects. You know, Marcy Projects essentially created one of rap's first billionaires, and it's gonna be. It is, you know, the preservation society doesn't know that, mm-hmm. or or may not even quite understand it. And again, well, no, because they're blaring lights, keeping everybody awake up there too. Because I used to live across the street from Marcy. Yeah, and they would pull out <laughs> one of them police boxes and it had the big light on it and it was a generator and it would be up brrr, yeah. all night and then the lights look it was almost like we we're at wrigley field or something yeah you know, or, and then the relationship is interesting too with with these places that we are in. like st louis like you had a different relationship with st louis when you left than when you came back right right and so some of the things like from the hood we'd be like man get rid of that i don't care if it never but it's also like like New York, what's so interesting about the the housing projects that were there, like Marcy, Pro- like I think now they have like Marcy's like now all, it's like basically all senior citizens now. I don't know. And like they've like, they've sort of like, like they didn't take down those buildings, you know, like no, they're St. Not Louis. Down. No, no, I'm saying oh. like in St. Louis, Chicago. Like they like was like we were removing this history. Like this is done, you know. And I then, mean, part of it also had like biochemical waste underneath it. Yeah. People were getting sick. Uh, there was like a bunch of also like they they were social experiments. Mm-hmm. There even the architecture in itself was a social. Well, that was experiment. also the other thing was like the because you know those buildings the ones in chicago ones st louis are very similar right Mm -hmm. the high rises and you know you talked about like 
you know, not having agency over like design in certain communities or in your community with that particular building. And it was like, all we did was talking about why this design was fucked up. Yeah, you know, like that's all <laughs> we did. Yeah, like, 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 you know, why do you live in a, you know, a concrete box, you know, with mm. metal meshing fences, like you that. know, like that are, you know, like that's all we talked about, you know, like with as those relationships, yeah. asphalt as a playground, right? Yeah. Um, and because you know we'd like always play out there, and then we'd like fall down and fucking destroy our legs, really? and it was like, why? There, why is there no grass? You know, like, and so like you were having, you know, in those moments, like you're critiquing the architectural yeah, yeah. sort of environment around you, yeah. but it didn't matter, right? Yeah, because exactly. you were poor. Because yeah, there was nowhere for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what I say to say that I really appreciate it when we first met, what you were doing because there was a permission given to, right, mm. and a value ascribed to certain communities, right, mm. um, that always had design and always had character and always had, you know, all of those things, but it was just never, it was just sort of dismissed because mm. design is a, you know, upper middle class, rich person's, mm. you know, whatever, you know, $20 million, you know, townhouse or whatever, mm. right? That's how we see it, mm. right? And and you sort of did this other thing was like, actually, Mm -hmm. there's all of this stuff happening mm -hmm. in these other communities mm -hmm. intentionally so, you know intentionally by by the creator and then the, our flip like black cultures flip um first first real time you see us in film is in the 70s and if you look at all of them films it's very intentional design mm -hmm. right right it's just like rudy ray moore's dynamite mm -hmm. Like you're gonna see googly architecture. Like he intentionally did that, and then the, and now we're coming to the um, the realization that there were certain cities, or, you know, that cities that federally um, there was an intent to keep us on the other side of the park mm -hmm. right. or to have us be in the wastelands. Um, and I wanted, I thought it would be cool after starting it and after talking uh, to people about how maybe important it was because I didn't know what was missing in the game because I wasn't there that we know like what if we knew like what if we understood design like other people knew design you know what i mean my favorite joke and it's like kind of it's, it's kind of like dark joke but it's like your black friend has never been walking through like yo that's from the 1800s to 1976 right, 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 da -da -da. Right, like right, right. that's not how we <laughs> have existed in those type of and i want us to you know i i think that and that's why i started the account it, like modernism is cool and I really love what I've learned about modernism during this time. But I thought it would be fun if we just started to know the city and use like a beer spot as an inspiration and like felt like we can walk. Like, you know, Pratt, y'all, I don't know if y'all been to Pratt. Um, like Pratt's garden, their sculpture garden is open to the public and it's open 24 7. 24 7. But motherfuckers I know don't know that. Like, you, we see it And it's right gate. down the street from where like, I was living on, yeah. on Myrtle and, and Throop. Yeah, you just walk down, and several you know who blocks. walk in, and you know who don't walk in, right? Cause and it's and, that, and that's historic, right? It could be free all day, and it's just historic that these design kind of things, and we use them. A lot of us use them for to keep people out that we don't want in, in some place. You know what I mean? Well, then, just a funny reference to the work is like, a, like people want me to tell them, like, tell me the story, tell me the story, <laughs> and I'm like, there's a lot of stories, right? It just depends on who knows the reference and who doesn't mm. you know it's not about someone telling me what the work is about or oh well it's a you know, i i am the art is in the beholder's eye or whatever it's like <laughs> yeah. no i have a specific stories that i want to tell there are specific references to specific people and certain communities of people won't understand that some communities if you get close enough will understand it bright and clear as day mm. I, and, I also think about it as like I, you know, when you were talking, I was thinking about all of these. I did a show, Virgil Abloh's last show, who's also Midwestern mm -hmm. Chicago or Rockville, Illinois. Um, his last show was at the Brooklyn Museum and worked on it for three years. And the centerpiece of that show um, was this house, social sculpture. Mm -hmm. And it came out of David Hammond's sort of famous line about negritude architecture, right? Mm -hmm. Everything's always a 32nd of an inch off, right? And Naomi Beckwith mm. did a show about that at the Studio Museum in Harlem a lot, years and years ago. But there's this conversation between him and, uh, uh, meaning David Hammonds, and 
um, Kelly Jones, where mm-hmm. he's talking about going to the American South and seeing all these houses built by black people, but it was like just sort of something in the house was off, right? <laughs> and it was just, and Virgil was like, I'm gonna make that house, right? And so his last sort of architectural project as a living um, artist was this house at the Brooklyn Museum that's now in his archive and mm-hmm. it became this sort of social space and so it was activated all the time and all of that stuff. But mm-hmm. in talking to him and having these, cause I didn't quite, I was like, wait, what? You know, like <laughs> trying to sort of um, understand, you know, as the curator of that show, but it really was about trying to reroute sort of notions of like, you no know, black relationships to architecture, whatever they may be, it might not be this Federalist styled house from the, you know, 18 whatever, mm. um, but there are relationships. And he was mm. sort of really interested in those relationships. Um, and then it was also, when you were talking, I was also thinking about um, Elizabeth Alexander's The Black Interior. Mm. And she, the first sort of, int- the introduction to that book um, <coughs> talks all about the way that black people use the living room, mm. like the living room as like a public space in a black home. Mm. And she talks about like the photographs that your grandmother, you know, like whatever, but that's an architectural intervention in that mm. space, right? Mm. And so I'm like always thinking about sort of like, our histories are different for very obvious reasons. Um, but what is our sort of uh, relationship to the thing, right? Mm -hmm. To the museum, to the architecture, to whatever the institution is, Mm -hmm. right? Um, But yeah. I think it's question time. Oh, snap. (laughs) Any questions from anybody? I've seen a half hand. And can you say your name when you ask the question? We have a few mic runners coming down, and they will be gladly uh, to hand you a mic if you just raise it really tall and high. My man wrote the questions down. That's live. I know. That's right. I like a brother that takes (laughs) notes. All right. All right. So you said say my name? Yes, please. First and last. Uh, My name's Savior Alan Knight. Um, Pronounce he, him. I don't know. All right, so I wanted to say I enjoyed the way you were talking about the renewal and the destruction of objects and as a reference to capital value. And when I went to see your work, I got an instant sense of permanence and artifact quality and also the built-in knowledge that you were kind of uncovering today. So I was interested, how do you see your work in reference to pushing forward black artistic objects as they attempt to break or revamp that model? Hmm, that's interesting. That's a tough question. But you know, last year yeah, I had came, an exhibition. He didn't come to play with them. That, that's fine. That's fine. I got something for him right here. Just wait. Just wait. You know, last year I, I last year or the year before last, I had opened a, a solo exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art. I don't know any thirty-year-old men having shows at the Museum of Modern Art. It was also in collaboration with the Studio Museum in Harlem, and. Uh, that exhibition, out of that exhibition, the Brooklyn Museum bought one of the sculptures and the Museum of Modern Art bought one too. And so just having that sculpture in that place and continuing to have relationships with people, like, well, there's a several facets to your question. There's the facet of the general public's understanding, the art historical narrative that will be constructed in the books, and then the narrative that will be taught in school. So which, which fa- you want me to answer a reference to all three? Well, the, the art history version is I am friends with a lot of curators. <laughs> and so when you're friends with curators and you, I studied art history in college. And so the, the, the narrative, uh, the perspective of communication and language is something that I use and foster as a tool that I sharpen in my studio. So the references, like I also, we talked about photog- the reference of photography in relationship to my ceramic sculptures. The kiln in and itself is a shutter box. Right, the aperture, aperture of the firing catalyzing the ceramic to be permanent, my brother, it's like built into the material value and the material meaning. So it's like I intentionally started making pottery when I was 12 because my dad, I think, maybe, like knew a woman who was working at the pottery studio, and then I learned how to make pottery. 
I've been making pottery for 19 years, and I met a woman, and she was like, oh, you should go to the Kansas City Art Institute. I went to Kansas City Art Institute. They said, oh, you can get a double degree in art history. I was like, I'll do a double degree. I'll, you can get a minor in Asian studies and minor in social practice. I was like, fuck it. I got a full scholarship. I'm going to get that, too. <laughs> Studied abroad for a year uh, around the world, and so it's like, I just kind of take it on as it comes to me, and if it, you offer it, I, you know, and it's enticing enough, I might just have to take you up on it. And so, thinking about the history of art, thinking about what uh, isn't necessarily present, like you know, maybe some people here would know the name um, Betty Woodman. Betty Woodman is an old lady who made a lot of beautiful ceramic sculptures, and she was the first woman to have a retrospective at the Met. Li first woman, living woman to have a retrospective at the Met. You know, so it's like, if she did that in 2011, it's 2023, and I'm at MoMA with ceramics. You know, they're not, so it's like, the media in itself carries so much. I just have to have enough space and time to continue to work with it, to keep putting forward innovative um, intention. And hopefully, as you experience uh, this exhibition and other exhibitions coming forward, as I don't plan on passing away anytime soon, uh, <laughs> in that, you will continue to see uh, my voracious uh, compassion, uh, the compassionate relationship that I have with, uh, with that material. Another brother. Hello, welcome to Minneapolis, St. Paul. My name is Richard Moody, and what I want to say to you is kudos to you three young brothers that you collaborate with each other, that you found each other from the Midwest, and you choose to grow together. So, and I'm an old brother, old, black, and crabby, 66. Young, man. So what I want to say to all the young brothers and sisters that life is possible, working together is necessary, Collaborating is a must. So you three young brothers from the Midwest got out. No I actually you're still live there, so yeah, I'm not yeah, even yeah. Like, I live but in St. Louis. But you're but traveling. Right near the river. You're traveling, <laughs> and what we forget is information is power, and seeing the world is power. So yes, thank you is. for being here in Minneapolis-St. Paul at the Walker, sharing your knowledge, letting young people of color know work together. You found each other. And you're sharing. And you found us too. Thank you, you for know, that. Here, we on the stage, I got my ticket. We're too far away. You so know? thank you. Appreciate that. Yep. Thank you. What's it? What's it been like? Let me do one of the questions. What's it been like being home? Oh, you're, you're asking. Yeah, me. Yeah, my bad. Oh shit. I was yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> you asking who been home? What's it like being in St. Louis right now? And you're a popping artist for real. Well, I uh, I was born in San Diego, California. I've grown up throughout the Midwest. Mo for five years, I lived in Norfolk, Nebraska with my mother, but then um, I moved when I was six to St. Louis until I was 18. And I, you, like you said, you know, it's like life experience of a place and then you have another experience of a place and you're thinking, we're thinking about memories as place, but also our physical person in place. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went to college at the Kansas City Art Institute when I was 18 and I left and I remember that day my grandma was crying. I was I sure was crying too, and I was like, I don't know why am I crying? I'm leaving home, and I'm going to college, and I'm so excited, but I'm crying in the car. What the fuck? Um, and then I, you know, every summer, and w well, summers I would go on study travel program trips, but before those trips, I'd go home to be with my grandmother, and then in the winter, I'd also go on faculty-led trips. So, but then I would also fly from St. Louis to wherever we were going, and so it was like I always kind of went back to the same ceramic studio I was going to. But it was always different. Mm -hmm. Then when I graduated from my bachelor's, I got a fellowship to go to Washington University in St. Louis. And so I had high hopes to leave. <laughs> I wanted to go to Yale University, Columbia University, UCLA, School of the Arts in Chicago. Uh, the fellowship was just a better option. And, and I could, you know, offer my grandmother the opportunity, like, you know, let me get a duplex and you live in one and I get live on the other. But I'd take care of us. And, you know, she told me no. So I had to find other housing and I like lived really close to campus because I had been accustomed to living one block away from my studio for four years. So I was like, well, shit, I got to get do the same thing in grad school. I graduated. I taught for several years. Um, 
different institutions. And then 2019, I had the chance to buy a house. I bought a mixed use building. That was the last one built in my neighborhood in 1921. It was a light commercial property and it was built as a hardware store and was always in a hardware store until about 2010. The family sold the building. They like tried to make it a music recording studio, and then this guy had like a wood shop in it, and then I acquired it. It has two one bedrooms on the second floor and a storefront. For the last two and a half years, I've been remodeling that whole building. So the second floor is keeping the two one bedroom apartments because I shouldn't have listened to the last contractor I was working with. I should have <laughs> opened it up. I should have took the walls out, made an expanded kitchen, you know, all the sexy stuff, <laughs> but I didn't. In the back apartment was my grandmother's before she passed. <laughs> The front I was living in and the storefront is now this like huge open floor plan loft with a full bath, a half bath, a crazy kitchen in the middle of the room and a 55 foot long wall that I can hang all the art that I've been buying. Hey, yeah, pull up. So being <laughs> at home has been like making making home in St. Louis and having homes in, in other places, home in New York, home in like I, like my part of my heart lives in New York. Part of my heart lives in Southeast Asia when I went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So like there are places that I yearn also to go to again. So when I think about being home in St. Louis, it's a means to an end because last year I also bought a 13,000 square foot warehouse with a half an acre behind it. And so that half an acre for the last three months, I've been working with an architect to start to design what what building I could build behind my studio and create this complex that could be a kind of next generation to what uh, the Sama Noguchi did in Long Island City. Wow, I didn't know that. I yeah. know the, the other part. Yeah, That's it's crazy. like, it's been crazy. Like, I like went home, cleaned a bunch of shit up, and sold some, like, inherited, like, a sh uh, shipping container. I got a four, I had a 40 foot shipping container behind my studio. What the fuck I need that for? So I got rid of that. I had like a broke down box truck, sold that. I ripped out the bathroom in the warehouse. I put in new windows. I got rid of the corrugated metal over the windows. I opened it up. I have a 16 foot clear story with um, these crazy uh, metal the metal structure to hold up the roof is like pre-war because you can see that the metal was riveted. Mm. They weren't screws and bolts. So it's, it's just like, it's just beautiful to be home, to be honest with you. I feel like that's one of the way, I don't know what our time looks like, but I feel like that's one of the, the uh, our key sort of connections is like going back home during that time. Yeah. And like finding space. I just think it's so interesting being home and, and you know, no, like in, in St. Louis, people are looking at you like, what is this dude doing in this warehouse? Like, I'll be honest you know, with you. A lot of people do. They were like, oh, can I speak to the owner? I'd be like, hey, I'm the owner. Uh, can you uh, inspect these gas lines for me? They're like, mm -mm, what you do here? Or like, see, or like being in New York and telling people that like you live in, you know, St. Louis currently. Like, they're like, what are you, what are you doing there? I mean, no, actually, I have to be honest with you. Most people I tell I live in St. Louis, they're like actually really excited because mm -hmm. there's like these whispers between communities that they're like, oh, this guy in St. Louis, he's doing something. You know, it's like pretty cool because he had a show and da 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 da. So it's like not too weird. Yeah. People only say the weird things about St. Louis or traveling to the Midwest to other people. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's nothing there. There's no artist there. How how could how could you go there? You know, like I don't ever get that. Yeah. I see this I see I see this work as an extension of that of that space of your studio. That's what I don't know how cuz I since you showed it to me, showed me the vastness of the studio. I just see that here. I see I almost that's that's just like the first things that uh that I see in this piece. Well, I also have to say thank you to William, who helped me organize this program here at the Walker. You know, William came to visit St. Louis. William measured the floor with me while I was trying to figure out how can I get this thing installed in my in my studio because I want to see it in my studio one day, which I don't think that's ever going to happen. Uh, but so maybe an iteration of something similar could. So we changed the model. We shifted the space. We, I mean. We edited this installation with the curator who invited me, Vincenzo, uh, several times. I remember drawing the idea of this platform on the benches outside the restaurant after lunch. And um, yeah, it's been really special. Before I say thank you, anybody else got a question? No? I think Antoine has something he wanna say. You have something you wanna say? Uh, no, I just was going to say thank you um, for gathering us you. and for 
um, putting on the show and look forward to continuing the conversation. Really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you all for sharing this uh, time and space with us. And thank you, Antoine, Gerald, and Khalil. Um, I want to invite one more Midwesterner down to the stage. Join us, because this evening is not done. Um, we would love to invite you all to join us up in our cargo lounge. We have some drinks and snacks provided by Chef Justin Sutherland and his team. Um, you may know Justin from Handsome Hog, uh, from Northern Soul, from Iron Chef, from seeing him down the road, you know, walking around. He's from here. He lives here. Um, not only is he doing all this work, but he also has started um, a nonprofit that works in social justice. Um, but we wanted to invite him to the stage to tell us a little bit about what we're going to be doing this evening after this. These three will also be joining us. The conversation doesn't have to end if you have questions. Um, but I'll let uh, Justin talk for a minute or two. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you to Walker for having me. Thank you, Khalil. Uh, work is amazing. Uh, we, this is the second time we tried to do this. I think six months ago, uh, we, got, we got snowed out trying to do this. Um, I'm actually kind of glad we had that, that pause. It really gave me an opportunity to, to dig into some of Khalil's work and, and the, uh, you know, the things that drive it. And so I really got to try and reimagine some of the food that we do. Um, I do a lot of soul food, a lot of southern food. But seeing how he speaks about uh, deterioration and value and, and how things change and perception. So I really tried to take some, and, and the black experience uh, as a whole. So it was uh, exciting to try and take some dishes that we classically serve and just try and do them in a different light and, and seeing things, uh, how are they perceived differently, if they taste differently, if they're served differently. Um, you know, we're gonna do a smoked watermelon ceviche and he talks about how, you know, cities deteriorate. Ceviche is all about breaking things down and just how this watermelon, we took it and smoked it and having it break down in the acidity. Um, we're gonna do a pimento cheese dip, but in a little mini waffle cone that's gonna look more high, a very humble uh, snack that, you know, hopefully looks a little more high end and with the perception of that. Uh, shrimp and grits we're gonna serve in some, you know, in some Chinese little spoons uh, with different flavor profiles. So just some fun bites that were very, very, uh, inspired by Khalil's work, and uh, I'm just uh, happy to share that with you, so thanks for having me. Thank you. One more thing I want to note, the ticket that you were given to come in also serves as a drink ticket. Um, we'd like to host your first drink. Uh, we're going to head up and out, then you're going to take a left, go up the big stairs, and that is where the evening will continue. So thank you all. We'll see you up there. All right.